Good morning, Sense of Things. It's Jeff and Ron, and we have another weekly update. And this week is uh, somewhat unique because it's what we've been talking about for several months, the uh, debt ceiling and what the negotiations and all that. And from the time that we left off last week to where we are now, guess what? We're still kind of going. So Ron, morning, my friend. Morning, Jeff. Well, it can't be more topical because after, hopefully after this podcast, we won't talk about the debt ceiling anymore Thank for a couple God. of years. Yeah. And as we're doing the podcast, uh, the Senate will be voting soon. It already got through the House, so we'll see. Uh, not that it's the best thing for our economy, but it, yeah. it saves us from default and whatever. Obviously, it's not the optimal plan, but uh, we'll have yeah. to see what happens. It, it's a big pile of nothing for both sides, and uh, we're just... <laughs> just <laughs> it's kind of a big steaming pile of nothing. So oh, I agree. We'll, we'll go with I that. I agree. Well, uh, I think you had a kickoff for us in our yeah, series. Uh, of, come on. Uh, we, we, we've always got to start off. with a little bit of fun and, and why not just go to our go-to topic? Hey, top Florida man headlines. Now, I love this. Now, look, any as everybody knows that for fun, you could go into your phone, Google, whatever, and just type in, most people do their birth date and they type in Florida mm -hmm. man. And the interesting thing I found about this was, is that there are websites just dedicated to this. And you would think like these headlines are just from Florida publications. Mm -hmm. They are not. Oh no. They're all over the United States. Can you imagine these journalists like scouring the police blotters all over Florida for these headlines. I mean, let's just go with the top five headlines. Number <laughs> number one, Florida man through live gator in Wendy's drive through window. There we go. <laughs> Was he not happy with the new fries or the burger? Was he hoping for a Whopper at Wendy's? I, I don't <laughs> I no know. I did. Maybe or it was maybe, a pet maybe, gator. Maybe, he, it maybe the gator, gator was the run of the litter and he didn't want it anymore. It could be. I mean, maybe it, you know, maybe in Florida. I know when I go to New Mexico, you know, the Wendy's has like a green chili burger. So maybe in Florida they have a, a gator burger. I don't know. I don't know. Let's keep going, though. <laughs> Inmate insists syringes pulled from rectum are in his. Okay. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the cops planted that or not, but <laughs> hey, God bless. I couldn't imagine how this got in the police blotter either. I, I really don't know, and I can't even imagine how it would get there to begin with. Here's a fun one. Drunken Florida man on a Segway charged with DUI. Makes hey, look, I sense. applaud him for at least leaving the car at home, but my goodness. Yeah. Well, I mean, I look at it. If you've ever ridden on a Segway, I cannot imagine riding on one of those things drunk because I couldn't ride on it regular. So I got to tell you, I did it for the first time two years ago. Um, I always wanted to do it uh, just yep. for the hell of it. It was actually really cool. And after like 10 minutes, you kind of get used to it. Yeah. Um, I got to tell you, very impressive technology. It's unbelievable. But yes, I agree with you. I don't <laughs> think I'd want to be intoxicated. <laughs> Florida man calls 911, says he needs a ride to Hooters. I Jeff, that wasn't is, you during that last trip it, down it there, was, was not, it? It was not. It was not. I did not ask to go to Hooters. I asked to go to Wendy's, actually. Ah, right. Well, you had your gator with you, but <laughs> you had, had a hankering gator. for wings. Maybe Wendy's didn't have the wings, so that's why you called 911. I threw the gator to to in Hooters. the window, yes, and then asked for 911 to come pick me up. Absolutely. All right, next one. Florida man attempting to time travel crashes in the strip mall. I don't know if he was trying to go 88 miles an hour, if he I'm, was in a DeLorean or not, but I was, uh, was going to say he was at a DeLorean or a, you know, 1975 Nova. I'm not sure which, but right. And then of course I got a bonus one, Florida man bitten in the face by alligator while playing disc golf. Okay. I, I sure that's perfectly understandable, but I, it, I've seen it on the golf courses before. So why not disc golf? And apparently he probably grabbed it and took it to Wendy's and threw it in the window at the time. So. All right. You're, re you're reading the storylines along with me. And then I got one little nostalgia thing. I came across this and I'm like, all right, hey, I watched Sesame Street when I was a kid. I mean, I know it just came out or whatever, but this was interesting. So Cookie Monster, he was mm -hmm. actually originally created for a potato chip ad called Muchos. Munchos. He, he was oh. so popular that Sesame Street use that character and instead of potato chips gave him a love of cookies cookies wow. so he was I, no I have longer a, the potato chip monster he became the cookie the monster. cookie monster hey and munchos are good dude you can eat a whole bag of those in no time because i've like, never had munchos oh that don't don't start it's like it's it's worse than crack all right so talking the about munchos crack, monster talking about crack and food that has street value mm -hmm. what's your favorite cookie 
Oh, got to be chocolate chip. But my very, very specific chocolate chip, Philadelphia, downtown, at the uh, at the uh, Reading Terminal Market. Reading, Reading Market Terminal. Reading Market. Mm -hmm. um, in there, there's a little coffee shop, and they make a chocolate chip cherry sea salt cookie. The wow. greatest cookie ever. My wife figured out how to make them when we came back from that vacation. After having that, you were done for the day. You probably kicked back and had a cigarette. Dude, no, I don't smoke, but I just had another cookie. It was awesome, man. Just <laughs> riding on a double-decker bus in like 40 degrees outside, drinking coffee and eating eating cookies, man. It was, it was a great trip. I, I will say I have two cookies. One, if you're gonna if you're gonna dunk it in milk, chips ahoy is the way to go. Yeah. But my real kryptonite is or is double stuffed Oreos. If you wow. if you want to get to my heart, it's double stuffed Oreos. It's double stuffed way, it's gotta be the way to go. Now, are and you every a, now and then? Are you a also break for the cookie? dunking? Nut or butter peanut butters cookies. All right. Now, are you a are you a break the cookie or or break the uh, the Oreo apart and scrape it off and then eat the cookie, or are you just straight on full on cookie? Well, I will say this: I have, but I didn't ascend to this side by spending that much time breaking apart and eating the cookies. <laughs> Yeah, you, you kind of, you, and the thing is, you, it's like potato chips. Those Oreos, you yeah. can't have one. No, absolutely no. not. That's You're why eating, I don't by, eat by them By the time anymore. you know it, you've already eaten a half a sleeve of them. Yeah, that's why I don't eat them anymore. So and that's why I don't buy, I don't buy uh, the 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 uh, Girl Scout cookies because the little mint ones, I, I could literally eat an entire box of them and I don't need that. Oh, the Thin Mints? Yeah, this, this oh, yeah. Well, not the S'more, I think it was the S'more cookies. Or was the the one with the oh. coconut and the and the fudge stripes? Oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are good too. Yeah, I hear you. All right, where, all right. Where well, I guess we got to go? do a little work today. <laughs> where would you like to go from here? Well, I think we got to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is uh, our debt ceiling negotiations. Uh, we the the speaker of the house and the other weirdos um, got together and came up with a plan, and then uh, took it to the to the uh, House of Representatives, they mulled over it and passed it. And so now we're on to the Senate and hopefully this will be the last time we have to talk about this until January 1st of 2025, which means they'll run it right up to that time period. Um, we got not a great deal for either side, but it was a good compromise, I guess, or the best compromise you could get. Um, what do you think? you know, getting this out of the way and the potential default out of the way, what do you think the next steps are for our economy? Well, I know I've been talking about it for what, six to eight weeks, we both have. Yeah. Um, based on what I saw, and if you take a look at the volume in the market yesterday, specifically on the S&P, mm -hmm. I think we might've gotten a flush out in the last two days, meaning yeah. we've exhausted the top end of the top 10 S&P uh, uh, stocks. As a matter of fact, somebody came up with, well, the S it's not an S&P 500 anymore. It's an S&P 10 and it's an S&P 490. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, and I think we 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 near topped out a kind of a blow off top. I mm. think we've seen that. I mean, I, I love this. Uh, you know, interesting to get your slant on it. AI, they're like looking like, oh my God, we just dug up the ground and we found <laughs> AI. What a great AI has been around for decades. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, like money's been rushing into it. In my opinion, all the dumb money has yep. been rushing into AI in the last two weeks. The smart mm -hmm. money was in early on. Yeah. They've doubled it at this point. Will AI be the future? Of course. We've been Absolutely. talking about it for 30 years since Terminator 2, for crying out loud, came out in, in the early 90s. But, you know, realistically, you know, AI will be the future. But I think all those stocks, the majority of them, including NVIDIA, which is chip and the software, mm -hmm. the main software stocks, I think we got the blow off top. I think the top is in on those, meaning that I think now we start to get the pullback. How much? Don't know. But don't forget, tomorrow we have the... Uh, the uh, May employment number. Mm -hmm. uh, we have all of the main uh, economic numbers coming out before the June Fed meeting, which I know last week I said there was at least a 50% chance of a 25 basis point hike. Mm -hmm. I think we're 70 to 80 now. I and I just so heard yesterday that all these 
uh, 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 rate decreases that they were talking about in the end of the year mm -hmm. are now off the table. Yeah. I mean, come on. I, I mean, well, we knew that wasn't going to happen to begin with, but I mean, it's, I, I just yeah. love the markets where they, they sit here and, oh yeah, well, you know, the, the economy is going to slow and then they're going to start reducing it. No, they're not, you know? And I mean, I thought, like I said, two weeks ago, I, I said, you know, nil cash carry, I think from the, the Minnesota fed yep. really laid the cards out on the table. And he's like, you know, we're going to continue to push the interest rates up because we've got, you know, basically we've got cover because the, you know, the, the other mandate, which is in full employment, we're at full employment. I mean, people, anybody that wants a job can have a job at this point, literally. I um, agree. As a, as a matter of fact, you know, the other interesting thing uh, that they had talked about was, we, you know, a lot of people don't realize the average person doesn't realize that just because the fed increases rates, doesn't have an immediate effect. It takes mm. a minimum six to nine months, really nine to 12. And yeah. we started to see that because they started, what, May, June last year. Mm -hmm. We started to see the effect of that in the last three months. Yeah. And the credit tightening and mortgage rates hovering at 7 and 7 right now is slowing parts of it down. And with the credit tightening at the banks, it's going to hit the summer. I truly believe we, we kind of have a divergence here because we mentioned this last time that the summer travel, the the, the, the it's, that's, it's booked. that's already been paid. Air, so, air yeah. airline travel is already at pre-COVID levels. Mm -hmm. Hotels are booked. Vacation spots are booked. So you're going to get people just going away for the summer and just spending money, which is great for the restaurants, hotels, and, and hospitality community. But the other 490 stocks in the in the S and P 500 are flat to negative for the year, yeah. and they have all come out and guided lower over the next six to 12 months. And now maybe they're setting the bar lower so they can jump over it and look good at their quarterly uh, earnings announcements. But I'm sorry, we've gone through too many economic factors in the last six to eight episodes here that you can't ignore the facts despite no. the consumer. But yeah. after the and summer, I'm with all that spending, it's got to peter out at some point. Well, That's and, why and we've you, been talking about September and October for a significant pullback or even for negative GDP growth. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you see like uh, Home Depot numbers, you know, I think Home Depot is the, Lowe's, yeah. you know, Home Depot and Lowe's are that that touchstone of the real estate economy. And I mean, they just got, you know, poleaxed this last few weeks here with earnings. I think that's the beginning of that kind of tightening of the purse from people. They're, they're still going to spend money on travel and getting out. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, most of the travel from what I've seen is international. So they're spending money other places instead of here. Um, and, you know, they're, they're looking at, okay, I'd rather travel than fix up my house at this point. And I think you're seeing it there. The, you know, the, the consumer's purse is, is limited and, and they're going to put it where they, feel like is the best place right now. And, you know, they've worked on their houses the last few years. So it's, it's interesting to me. And, you know, if we see the, the real estate slowing down, and I think in certain markets it is from what I'm seeing, you know, in, in the Austin market where I live, it's fantastic right now. I mean, it's still doing extremely well. I don't know about Phoenix. Um, Very hot. Yeah, it's still hot. It's not crazy hot, but it's still yeah. hot in many areas. Yeah. And you've got a lot of people that are relocating from California over to Phoenix and things like that. Um, the Nevada markets, you know, Las Vegas is is starting to slow pretty significantly. The the California markets are slowing really significantly because of the outflow of people. So, you know, I think we're at the very beginnings of that real estate cycle, too, where there's going to be some challenges. And the, and the other thing to look at it with the real estate too, and this is why Lowe's and Home Depot are a fantastic canary in the coal mine, yeah. in, in the coal mine, excuse me. And that is the following. People that want to move, but are in low mortgage, have low mortgage rates, aren't moving because their mortgage rates would more than double. Yeah. So yeah. many of them have been taking the last year or so and putting money into their own houses. Mm -hmm. Well, where do you mainly go for those supplies and materials? Home Depot and Lowe's. Yeah. And if they're showing a slowdown, meaning people have either expended their budgets 
into their own houses or they don't have the money to spend. Remember, we were talking about credit card balances reaching and breaching the one trillion dollar level. Mm -hmm. That's a bit ominous, at least yeah. short term, short or medium term, not immediate term, because necessarily because we already see what's going to happen in the next three months with hospitality and travel spending. But if people put, aren't spending money in the house and they aren't moving, there's got to be a slowdown somewhere. Now, yes, there are pockets already of the United States that are in a recession. And I don't know if you saw this. I, I don't have the date. It was either the uh, might have been over the weekend or the end of last week. Germany officially just went into a recession mm. based on economic factors of being in a recession. Yeah. But there are states in the U.S. that have been in a recession for over a year. Yeah. But warm weather states like you and I and other key areas of the country that are, you know, producing still and have high uh, paying jobs, uh, they're still going strong. Mm -hmm. Manu big manufacturing states, big farm states, they're they're all hurting. Yeah, they're, they're all hurting. Well, and we've seen that on the data we've looked at the last few weeks, Philly, you know, the Philly manufacturing index, the New York, the Richmond Fed. I mean, all of those are showing slowing. Um, and and pretty significant reductions there. While you know we just saw consumer confidence and consumer sentiment this week still off, you know still above what the estimates are. So I think you know you're starting to see it in the in the manufacturing of okay that's slowing down. You know China's back online full on at this point. With you know I think there's another COVID strain that's popping up there, but I mean still. <laughs> Full on manufacturing, so you know we've got cheap goods coming in again uh, to the country. So you know, it, that and they're not even back at full capacity. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know, kind of looking forward, a lot of people wanted to strangle me when I was talking about it a couple of weeks ago. But I think we're at least going to have one, if not two, more rate hikes. Yeah. Now, during the summer, I don't think as many people will be paying attention because between the middle of July and the end of August, I mean, Wall Street, for the most part, is checked out on vacation. So we will get much more volatility during that time frame. But I think the more interesting part to all this is that until the job market slows and mm -hmm. until inflation truly dips under five and a half or six percent with some type of a precipitous pullback, they're not going to stop. They're not. Yeah. Now, we may not see a 50% uh, 50 basis point rate hike, but we could see one or two more 25 basis point rate hikes this summer, whether people like it or not. And at that point, that may be the straw that breaks it. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, the, the Fed has their mandate and all the extemporaneous factors they're not paying attention to. Well, no. I shouldn't say that. They're looking at it, but they have but, a myopic it, focus yeah. to say, hey, we need to bring down inflation and uh, we're not done yet with the Fed rate hike. Yeah. So whether people like it or not, get ready, buckle well, up. And, and their dual mandate is we need to reduce inflation and we need full employment. Well, we have full employment at this point and really no no change so far that we're seeing. So, yeah. okay, we've got to fight inflation and that their their tools are raise interest rates and, and open market activities. And I mean, they've already reduced their balance sheet pretty significantly over the, the last yeah, year I know I know you follow this economic factor. I don't follow it as closely, mm -hmm. but the JOLTS report just came yeah. out, I think earlier this week, and it was up, meaning mm -hmm. the job openings w went up. Yeah. Now, but that's after that, a really precipitous I know the Goldman Sachs drop. and some of big institutions announced some major layoffs, but mm. the jolts went up. I didn't really dig into it as far as um, where those job openings are, whether they're low, medium paying jobs or they're high paying jobs. I didn't really pay attention to that. But I think that did shock a lot of people to say, hey, yeah. folks, we're still hot. And as soon as that jolts report came out, all the expectations of a possible rate decrease at the end of the year dissipated. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely not. And that's the first time it's jumped up in almost a year. Wow. Um, you know, we went from at the absolute peak, which was around 12 million jobs, yeah. we dropped down into the 9 million range and we've been kind of in that steady decline into nine. And then it popped up, you know, up to 10 or up to 10. And, you know, that it, it's an interesting thing. And I honestly, I didn't really take a look at that. So, you know, before next week, I'll actually get in and, and dig into it a little bit and see where those jobs came from. But, you know, I mean, once again, 
all right, now there's more job opportunities out there. You know, the unemployment is is running around what three and a half, four percent. Yeah, at three, the four, most. three, five. Yeah. So effectively, anybody that wants a job could potentially get one at this point. Maybe they don't want those jobs, but the reality is, okay, this is it's an interesting time because once again, I think the Fed's going to continue to do what they believe is the the best thing for the country, which is okay, let's slow things down. You know, even with the debt ceiling negotiations, with everything that happened out of this bill, I don't think there's, you know, we're still at 40% higher than we were pre-pandemic as far as government spending. So with that fiscal side of things, it's just not going to slow the economy down. Yeah, and I know this still is got a lot sound, of push. Yeah, and I know this is going to sound political, and I'm not trying to be at all. Yeah, but with as many job openings as there as there are, why why haven't they cut down the you know unemployment insurance payouts mm -hmm. in half as far as the amount of weeks? Yeah, why why are they still doing other social programs for handouts for people that aren't working when there are more job openings and people to fill those jobs? Yeah, how, how many? tens of millions, hundreds of millions, or even billions of dollars, could we put potentially into paying down our debt over the next six to 10 months by just cutting back on those programs to say, go get a job, Yeah. right? By you saying there's nothing out there, obviously we have a communication problem here. We have a failure to communicate, quote, quote, quoting one of our favorite movies back yeah. in the late sixties with Paul Newman. But we have 10 million of those sitting out here that, you know, are, are open and available. Yeah. To you. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever, whatever the amount of uh, weeks that you're going to collect unemployment, we're cutting it in half because mm -hmm. you got to go get a job. If we were yeah. in a recession and if that unemployment rate was seven or 8%, it's a different story, yeah. but yeah. I'm sorry. Um, and I, and I just don't think there's political will on both sides to do something that's specific and drastic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well, and I, you know, and even with, even with what got negotiated with uh, work requirements for people on government programs and things like that, I mean, I, I still don't believe that's going to happen. You yeah. know, there'll, there'll be ways that the agencies weasel around all that stuff or, or just, they don't monitor, uh, whether people are working or not. I mean, they, I don't think they have the people to even try and monitor that. And, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, of history of the world part one you know did you what what do you do for a living well i'm a stand-up philosopher oh a bullshit artist did That's you right. bullshit this week? Comicus. yeah Comicus. 1981 that movie was great <laughs> flick is. and you want to know something mel brooks god bless him still alive in his early 90s offended so many people yeah. you would think you know being a Jew that, you know, he was doing a lot of anti-Semitic, he was making fun of everybody in that movie, okay. let's just be honest, but he offended Hollywood so much that they did not let him make a part two. I know. Instead, they let him make Spaceballs, yes. which was his last really great movie. That is exactly true. And you got to fit Blazing Saddles in there too, because... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I will tell you this about Blazing Saddles. It's too long for a conversation today, yeah. but if you get the DVD, it's got the uh, director audible mel brooks is talking over in the first hour hour and a half movie and it is fantastic <laughs> listening to him explain how first of all the writing of the script because originally before cleavon little richard Pryor richard Pryor wrote the script to play that role but yeah. him explaining how difficult it was for him to convince hollywood to make him, uh, to let him make that movie because of one scene. Do you know which scene that was? Uh, probably the sheriff riding into town scene would be my best guess. Nope. That was probably top five. Yeah. But the number one scene was when they were all out on the prairie, sitting around the fire, making beans yes. and them all having a gas attack. Yeah. Hollywood, Hollywood censorship said, you can't have that scene. So it ended up that they tested the movie. Now we're getting into it. They tested the movie and that was the audience's favorite Great scene, scene. <laughs> because, you know, they were all adolescents, right? Yes. Probably. And they had, they had, they had to let, they had to leave the scene in. That's how insane Hollywood you is. You don't have to, you don't have to be an adolescent. A fart scene is just absolutely funny if you're 90 or if you're, you know, if you're 10 years old, it's, we're all 10 year olds yes. in there.
<laughs> yes, more men than women, or at least one that women that would admit it. But uh, exactly no, right. I, I agree with you. But yeah, if you ever get a chance, I don't know if it's on YouTube, but it's on the yeah. DVD. You just got to listen to Mel Brooks. First, he's just great to listen to. Yeah. But to him, talk about the movie, the script, um, and how it was made is just, it's just magic. That's all well, I can the, say. I'll uh, tell you what, we, go ahead. We own the, uh, we own the whole collection, uh, the, the Mel Brooks collection. Oh. And the other funniest one is listening to him talk about the, the behind the scenes of, Fra of young Frankenstein. Uh, oh, I never listened to that. Okay. God awfully funny. I mean, it's just hilarious. And listening to that, and then going back and watching the movie, I caught a whole bunch of things that I had never caught. I've seen the movie literally a hundred times and there were things I didn't catch until I listened to that. And just all the crazy little stuff that happened with the, the oval teen and all that type of stuff. And he's just talking about Cloris Leachman's mastery of just, you know, that, that funny pause and almost hurtful expression and all this stuff. I mean, it's just, it was great. And, and as what good as it, she was in Young Frankenstein, she was even better in High Anxiety. Yes, she was. As nurse, she, as a, like the nurse, nurse Ratchet uh, yep. uh, one. And her and Harvey Carmen, I mean, yeah. are just classic scenes. They stole the movie in every scene that the, those two were in together. Probably the most underrated movie of hers too, because I absolutely love High Anxiety. I just think it is absolutely one of the funniest 1977, movies. great flick, yeah. great flick. I'll tell you what, let's wrap up. I just want to yeah. share something uh, on the debt ceiling uh, history. And I, I think it's something that's very interesting because we've talked about it, you know, whether, whether, you're, whether you're blue or red in the middle, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. This is the problem. Because the number one job for politicians is to get reelected, they're not mm -hmm. fiscally responsible. Most don't have a business background. Certainly, they're not, you know, academic uh, economists. But this is the problem. I, if you remember, in the late '80s, early '90s, when Japan's economy was just thriving, mm -hmm. but a lot of why they were thriving was they were printing money and buying everything in sight, and they had good productivity in the manufacturing and technology. But they're they, they we always laughed or they we always talked about how high their debt to GDP ratio was yeah. because if you're owing that much money, eventually your economy will collapse. As a matter of fact. The Nikkei, which is the J Japanese stock market index, similar to our S&P 500, just hit a 30-year high, meaning mm -hmm. where they were 30 years ago, they just surpassed it in the last month. Yeah. If you take a look at this chart here, going back to 1970, how the hell can we continue to spend more money than we're taking in? And there's only two ways to fix it. And I don't think the political is where uh, the political will is there short term or long term that you got to raise taxes and you got to cut spending. And if any politician votes for that, they'll be out of office. That's exactly but right. Instead, this is going to continue to go up. How are we going to be able to compete? I, mm -hmm. I, and it may be not our generation. We're in our 50s. But the next generation, holy crap, the generation after. Um, we're going to lose recur reserve currency status. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Well, I, and I think, you know, if, if we look at history and we were having this discussion before we got on camera today, you know, about Britain and, you know, the, the British were the reserve currency, were basically the, the economic leaders of the world up yeah. until World War II. And, you know, I think they're somewhat arrogance. Um, not just somewhat arrogance, they're arrogance. And, and in some cases, it's a, it's a model of what we're experiencing right now. We need to be realistic about this because it could hurt us pretty significantly if we lost reserve currency status because our currency is you know the basis of energy prices, of gold, of you know, virtually anything in the world that's publicly traded is traded based on the dollar. They said within five years of uh, England using uh, losing the reserve currency status, their market got cut in half, and their value of their the value of their currency yeah. got cut more in half. So, mm -hmm. is that a historical, you know, uh, prerequisite of what we could be in for as far as what we could expect? Mm -hmm. um, anything is possible. China has wanted to be the world's uh, reserve currency for decades. Yeah. And uh, they're pushing towards it. Um, again, 
You know, Britain got to the point where they were very stodgy and very stubborn about how they should build and whatever. And they got ravaged by World War II and they had to borrow, which is another reason which contributed to them losing the reserve currency. Well, folks, we're headed in that direction. Yeah, you know, and I think the, the difference with us is we tend to be, you know, the way our economy was set up, we, we tend to be very, you know, we tend to have higher productivity. We tend to be very innovative, but I'm, I, I worry that we lose that, you know, we lose a little step to it because we've got a lot of people in that, in this world that, that don't believe that, you know, that's a good thing necessarily. And I, I totally disagree. I think that our natural freedoms, you know, our constitution makes us very unique in the world. Um, and it ensures that, you know, the reason a lot of people want to come here is because of the the world that we've created uh, inside the United States. And if we lose that, you know, I think we we lose a big step. But, you know, I don't think that's tomorrow, but it's a, a conversation that needs to continue to be had. It's and certainly a when we, yeah, and certainly when we elect, you know, elected officials, we need to be considering, okay, why are you getting elected and what are you there to do? And if you if you don't do this, if you don't focus on, you know, fixing these problems, all you're doing is kicking the can down the road to, you know, people's kids and grandkids and making this problem worse and, and unfortunately creating a world where they see the world as, you know, hey, the government's just a big handout waiting to happen. Um, I think, you know, a big, it, the the big red wave that was supposed to have happened in the fall, I mean, I think two factors affected that, the the abortion argument and and certainly the extremist the student, well, the student debt side of it. I mean, that really activated the young people because they saw, hey, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm going to, you know, I went to college and now I'm going to get part of that, you know, taken or, or, or covered and taken away from me or, or paid off for me. Well, I mean, the reality was that was never going to happen. I mean, it's, it's kind of illegal. In a lot of well, aspects. actually, I believe that's what they're passing. They, they, they did leave yeah. some of that in, but what pe some people don't realize is that student debt isn't like three or 4,000 with many of these people. Yeah. It's 50, 75, a hundred, yeah. $150,000 or more. Yeah. And yeah. what they were proposing to pay off in was student like debt grand. was I think 10,000 or yeah. less. <laughs> What yeah. is that going to do? It, it does right? nothing. Yeah, get a did. job and pay it down, yeah, or like, get an education that is really good, but you don't need to spend two hundred thousand. But you can't tell absolutely. people that because they're going to do what they want to do. Well, and I mean, it's you know, why did you go to why did you go to the two hundred thousand dollar a year school to get a fifty thousand dollar a year job? I mean, that's the, the reality of it, and that's yeah. a whole nother discussion yeah. down. Forget the road, about getting but, married, buying a house, or having kids. Yeah, just your, pay your, off your student you. debt is your kid. Yeah, for the next yeah for the next sixty years, it's going to hang around like a pet. Um, but yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I think at least we're at least we get the whole default off of the off the world. Now we need to now we need to really focus on the markets and and what's going to have some effect. And I I agree with you. I think you know what we need to be focused on, or what we'll probably end up talking about most of the summer is going to be what's going on from the the company side of the world to the consumer. And I think the consumer is the key there. If uh, if the consumer starts feeling, you know, it more and more tightened up on and, you know, the effects of the economy rolling into the consumer, that's yeah. really where we've got to be the most concerned right now. And I don't think that we're going to see the Fed stop anytime soon. I, I agree with you. I think we have 50 more basis points at least that is going to hit us before year end. Yeah, I think the next two to three weeks, and certainly we'll have plenty of uh, fodder for conversation and mm -hmm. uh, um, it'll get more interesting. Hopefully, uh, hopefully people just don't uh, stick their head in the sand and they pay a little bit more attention, but uh, to, be, to be seen. Absolutely. And we're going into a, a presidential election year. So it just gets all kinds of fun at that point. So. It's going to be a bloodbath. Yes, it will. All right, my friend. Well, thank you. And uh, folks, thank you for being on here. We uh, we do these for you. So certainly make sure that you subscribe to the channel, hit that little notification button so that you know when these things come out. 
And most definitely make sure that you give us a comment, share, uh, give us your favorite uh, Mel Brooks movie. I'd love to love to hear that after our little weird discussion on that today. Thanks a lot. We'll see you back here next week. And we do these every Thursday. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you on the next time. Boom.